Um, last week, I talked about understanding the covenant, um, and I ended up right where the new covenant came in. Today, I'll continue, but it should be, or the topic is, leaving out the covenant, and then our response to God's covenant love. If I should have a little bit of recap from last week, looks like there was a little bit, I would say that people didn't get it very well. So, if you didn't get anything, I'll summarize the main ideas behind. And that was covenants, you can consider them as binding agreements. And then failure to adhere to it till serious consequences. Oftentimes the consequences are very severe if the terms are not met. And one thing God does, dealing with various human beings, God normally uses covenant. And the purpose of it is to demonstrate how faithful He is to us. So that it means that it's a serious business when he's dealing with us, that form. With God's covenant, many of them, I will say, are one-sided, meaning that God takes the responsibility, assuming of the fulfillment of the covenant, so that the failure of it, the whole responsibility is on him. Those were the covenant that he made with Moses, not Moses, with Noah, Abraham. The other type of covenant, the ones which are two-sided, that God establishes covenant with us. That was mainly the covenant that he established with Moses, the Israelites to Moses. Unfortunately, and if you look at that covenant, they are two-sided. God says, I'm going to do something. But before that, you have to do something else. And what God demanded was obedience for his covenant law. The Israelites failed Israel. So God decided to establish a new covenant. And that new covenant is the one which was established through Jesus. And it mainly um, was opened to us through Jeremiah. And most important of all, what we should recognize is covenants between God and man are initiated by God. So meaning that we cannot establish covenant with God, we only affirm the covenant that God has established. And the reason why mentioned Jesus gave it is the word of meaning that we will not be able to fulfill any terms that we try to impose on God. And because of that, she let it stay. And Jesus added a statement that anything beyond that from the devil. So if you didn't get anything at all, that was the main message last week. Today what I want us to consider is how do we leave our covenant? Or what should be our response? God's covenant law. And I'm going to look at it from backwards up. I'll start with our responsibility. Then we go to Jesus' covenant. And then what actually the covenant that God has established, what God is doing, so that we don't get it wrong. So let's start with um, Deuteronomy 6 from verse 4 to 9. When Jesus was here, he mentioned it, I think it's in all the gospel, particularly in Matthew 22, 37, that he indicated that the responsibility of us as humans concerning the covenant of God is what is here that we are going to look at. The Jews call it Shema. I say that here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with 
all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be frontless between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. There are three main things that comes out here. This is according to Jesus, the greatest commandment. And that is how God wants us to reciprocate his love or his covenant. Here also one thing recognizes the importance of teaching and remembering God's command. And then at the end of it, he gave us practical ways of implementing that. This command to love God, we are supposed to do it with our heart, our soul, our strength, and Jesus added our mind, which means the whole human. And I often make this statement um, I hear people say that a human being is a spirit who lives in a body and has a soul. That is wrong. A human being is somebody made out of a spirit, a body, and a soul. You can't remove any one of them. And when people challenge me, I ask them. Jesus rose out with the body, the soul, the spirit. Without that, he is not a human being. He was God before he came. He existed. He came to become a human being and he has a human being form. That's why though the saints have risen up in heaven now, they are still not complete until the final resurrection when they get their body. Now they have their spirit and soul, all right, but without the body, they are not human beings. And one thing here is that these Shema, or to love God with all our hearts, is the foundation of the Christian life. It also keeps us, that it tells us the uniqueness of God and His sovereignty, because it says that God is one. When we love God, we are supposed to love God with our hearts. This means that we place Him at the center of everything that we do. It involves a commitment our emotions, our will, and our desire. It should not be a superficial or occasional love for God, but deep, abundant love, which should influence everything that we do. If we call ourselves Christian, then. What's something that I want us to reflect? Let's think about it. Looking at this, what does it mean to love God with our whole heart? And how can we ensure that our love for God is sincere and is all encompassing? Let's think about that. It also, one thing also that we see is the importance of remembering God's commands in this thing that is said. It goes beyond personal commitment and it calls for the commandment to be constantly in our presence or in our lives. What it means is we should always remember, we should reflect on it. We are also told to teach others, particular children, diligent. And we are also to make it a regular part of our conversation. So this means that loving God, when we say we love God, it should reflect how we live in our home, how we live with each other in our families, and live in our daily life, the routines that we have. Here we are supposed to create an environment where God's word will be honored and his commands are lived out. So it comes back to obedience. 
if we teach our children and discuss the ways of God to others and remind ourselves of his commands, it will help us. So that is how um, Deuteronomy put it, meaning the practical ways that we'll be able to live out the command that we have, meaning our response to God's love. So, if we look at what are some of the practical ways that we can love God, it should not just be a feeling and intention. We should be able to demonstrate it by our action. That is why John could say that if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, I think that's the word he used. They are lying. Because loving God should translate itself to loving others. Also, some practical examples that Deuteronomy gives us is we should talk about it in our homes. Morning, night. He also gives them physical symbols that they should use. Those are things that to keep them in remembrance, that they will remember the commands of God. Today we can do it, let's say, one or two or three examples. In our daily devotion and prayer, we can do that. We always start our day and our time with God's word and prayer. Or we just get up and move. Within our communities, we regularly discuss God's word with others. We encourage people with God's word. That will be something that we can do to show our love to God. And do we have tangible symbols to help us remember what God has said? For instance, we have notes that we can refer to. Let's think about it and see how or the practical ways that we can love God. It could be small steps, but it should be consistent that we always remember what God has done. So loving God with our hearts is essential of our covenant relationship him. It requires a wholehearted commitment, continuous reflection of his word, and practical expressions of the love in our daily life. When we love God in this way, we honor the covenant he has made with us, and then we are able to live out our identity. Now let's look at the second part of it. Now we've uh, talked about our responsibility or how we should reciprocate God's love. Let's go to Matthew 26, from 26 to 28. And this is mainly about the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Here, the key point is that Jesus he is revealing that he is a mediator between us and God as far as the new covenant is concerned. It also brings out the importance of the sacrifice that he was going to make when he made that, he made that pronouncement that to us the sacrifice on the cross. And also, it mentions about a communion as remembrance of the covenant. One thing is in the Old Testament, covenants were actually mediated through other figures like Moses, like Abraham. 
That is through them that we it trickled down to us, if you can say that. But Jesus is the ultimate mediator of the new covenant. So through Jesus' life, his death, resurrection, he has brought in a new relationship between God and us. That is not based on the old ways of the law, but it's based on love, grace, truth. If we recognize Jesus as the mediator, and we understand our relationship with God, we should know that it is not based on works, not based on what we do, not based mainly on doing, but it's based on what Jesus Christ has done. So, what it means that Jesus Christ has taken the responsibility to fulfill the term that was the old covenant, so that the new covenant will be ushered in. So it's only through his blood that the sacrifice and um, the new covenant is established. And if you should act, normally when covenants are made, there are signs associated with it. The signs are either as a reminder and mainly of the faithfulness of God or a reminder of the punishment which may ensue. If you think back at Abraham's, the covenant with Abraham, when God was, I'll use the word ratifying it, he made Abraham kill an animal, put it there, divided the animal into one at one side, and normally both Abraham and God should have passed through. And the indication is that if you fail, you'll be dead by this animal which has been separate. But God decided to pass through alone, meaning that, yes, if I don't fulfill it, I'm responsible, basically. Consider me as dead. And that but that is the reason why if a covenant has to be ratified with God, there should be some consequences. And Jesus took himself, just like the animal, to bear the punishment. So he went to the cross to die for it. So that the new covenant that is being established can be implemented. Here, the last supper, Jesus speaks of his, of his body, which is a symbol of the sacrifice that he was going to do, meaning dying on the cross. And also his blood which was being shared. That sacrifice is central to the new covenant because it fulfills all the requirements of the old one. And the old one, a temporary provision was made that if you sin, you need to bring an animal sacrifice for coverage. And Jesus did that so that there will be coverage of our sins. So this sacrifice, I would say, is the foundation or the cornerstone of our faith. Here we are supposed to reflect on the cost of salvation. Salvation is free to us, but it's very expensive for God. God Jesus had to come and die on the cross. He had to be separated from the Father because of sin. He made sin for us. Before we are allowed to the presence of God once again, uh, Adam, Adam lost that privilege and then Adam being our representative all of us lost it. Questions that I want us to consider how often do we reflect on the sacrifice of Christ when we take the communion? Does his death resurrection mean anything to us personally at all? And let's think, how can we live in a way that will honor the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made? Jesus instructed that we should do it whenever we take the communion, we should remember him. And this is supposed to be a vital practice for Christians. Every time we take the bread and the cup, we should remember Jesus' sacrifice. 
And then we should affirm our commitment to the new covenant, meaning that we should remember the cost and then determine that we will obey God. Whenever we take the communion, it should be a time of reflection, gratitude and renewal of our relationship. It should not be just normal ritual that we do. We should attach meaning. Let's do it with gratitude to God. When we approach the communion, let's think about it. Know that it will be meaningful and it will be glorifying to God. So the life and the sacrifice of Jesus, I would say, is a central part of the new covenant as a mediator he is the one who bridges the gap between God and us he offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice for sin so communion when we take it it should be a reminder of this covenant and the practice should cause us to be grateful of what God has done for us when we reflect on the new covenant, let it deepen our understanding of grace and let it strengthen our commitment to live in response to God's love. Let's make communion meaningful practice in our life so that we are continually renewed or renewing our relationship with God and our understanding of the covenant. So, looking at our responsibility and the sign of the covenant, if you like, let's go and look at the covenant itself. Last week, we looked at it from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. But here, today, we are going to look at it from Hebrews 8, from 6 to 13. It says, but now have he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promise. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So here he's going to go over to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. So he's going to quote it. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, said the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the great. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities that I remember no more. In that he said, a new covenant you have made the first old, out of which decayed and what is old is ready to vanish away. So what is God saying here? One or three things that we can look at, three key points. A new covenant is established on better promise. Jesus is the high priest of this better covenant. And one important thing that we often forget, this covenant entails the transformation of our hearts. If we look at this third part, it will prevent us from 
people who are saying that I'm safe, I'm going to have it, so I can do whatever I want. If you think that way, think again. What we are saying is that God hasn't done it. He says He's giving you a new heart and a new mind. So it means there should be transformation. If that transformation is not happening, go back to God to help you. So here the writer of Hebrews explains that the new covenant is superior to the old one and it's founded on better promises. The old covenant that was given to Israel on Sinai, that is what we say Mosaic covenant, was based on law and required perfect obedience, which people could not fulfill. And if you look at the covenant, God's part is beautiful, but our part, whenever you fail, the curse will come on you. We've been freed from that, God Jesus became that curse when he died on the this new covenant, however, is based on God's grace and the promise of inner transformation. I want us to stress on this inner transformation because to me that is probably what we miss out or maybe not well explained. And from my perspective, that is the reason why we don't see the difference between Christians and unbelievers in terms of our behavior. Because we don't look at it that God is transforming us. But we should align ourselves to what the Holy Spirit is doing for our lives to change. These better promises of the new covenant include the fact that we will be able to uh, have the word of God in us, more or less internalize it. It allows us to have personal relationship with God. It also gives us complete forgiveness of our sin. So that the fear of I've messed up, so yeah, God has abandoned me, will not come in. We'll always go back and press on. And these promises are not dependent on the ability of us to follow the law perfectly, but it's based on the sacrifice of Christ. It's there for me. So we are called to live in a life of freedom and assurance based on this promise. So when we reflect on this new covenant, let us remember. And the question that I will let us ponder is, how do these promises impact our faith and our daily work? Does it allow us To live out our life in a way that the love of God will be shown in us. And also, are we living in the freedom and assurance that comes from this new covenant? Jesus also being the high priest of this better covenant. Under the old covenant, Moses, the high priest, played a very important role when he mediated between God and the people by offering sacrifices of sin. So really, the priests are those who offer the sacrifices on the behalf of the Israel. But Jesus, he's the high priest of this new covenant. He offered himself once and for all. And the sacrifices has atoned for our sins. And it has given us a direct access to God. So his priesthood is eternal sacrifices sufficient for all time. If we understand this, there's one important thing that we should note. And that is, there's no other priest between us to get to the presence of God. He says it's a high priest. We don't need human intermediaries for any sacrifice or to bring us to God. And what that it translates to is that every Christian has equal access to God. My prayers 
is not more effective than yours or anybody else. Whether the person has a title or not. When you pray sincerely to God, we hear you just as if I pray sincerely to God. When we understand this, this removes the idea that if I don't get a pastor, nowadays they talk about prophets and apostles to pray with me, things will. They are not your mediators. Jesus Christ is. You go straight to the throne of grace. Present your case to God the best you know how. And expect God to answer you. That doesn't mean that you can call on somebody else to help you in prayer. That is valid. But what you must know that it's not because of that person's prayer that God will hear. The sincerity of the prayers which have been offered. And if you look at it, if something is affecting you, you will pray more. But where can I use it? vehemently than somebody else. You'll be able to present your case to God better than your helper who is helping you pray. So in effect, what I'm saying is you don't relegate the responsibility of going in the presence of God to somebody else. It is your responsibility as a Christian. And don't think that you are not worthy to approach God because it's not our worthiness which allows us to approach God. Rather, it's because of Jesus' worthiness. If we understand this, it will help us a lot. And then comes the last part, what God says he has done or doing within this new covenant. That is, he's transforming our minds and hearts. That he's writing his laws in our hearts. Meaning that you would then be able to obey God. And that will come naturally. Instead of the old nature of rebellion and whatever God is doing. This internal change reflects the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us. In that sense, guiding us deeper and deeper into relationship with God. We should not forget this. Even I think Paul, he puts it that it is God who is working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Meaning that our lives should be changing. Others use the big word, they call it sanctification. That our lives should be changing progressively, being more and more like Jesus Christ. That part should not be neglected because that part, when God is doing something in us, we should work with Him. The transformation means that we know we are no longer bound by external rituals like in the old days, but we are led by the Spirit of God to live a life which is genuine. To be able to live holy life, to be able to live a light which is right. This is a daily process. And we become more and more like Christ. Where our desires and actions will be aligned more and more with the will of God. So what I'll say is probably it's not in the eloquence of prayer. Or eloquence of preaching. But the real meat is that how are we allowing the Holy Spirit to transform? Meaning that God has put in our heart His way so that we'll be able to flow with Him. Do we take advantage of this or allow the old self to kick in? And then when there is problem, we throw the word of God and say that this is our Bible, we are not interested. We want to do it now. We allow the Holy Spirit's work to permeate our lives. Let's think about it. 
How is God's law being written in our heart? So that we will conform to his will. So that our desires will be aligned to his desires. What areas of our life for each and every individual do we need his, his transformation work? This calls for reflection and prayer so that we will be able to move with God when he's working in our life. So coming to an end here, conclusion. Today we've looked at somehow, I will say in depth, the new covenant which is established through Christ Jesus. We see that it is a covenant which is based on a better promise that Jesus is the mediator, Jesus is the high priest, allowing us to go to the presence of God. And this is marked by the transformation of our hearts and minds. This covenant is not a mere contract. It's a relationship. A divine, living, dynamic relationship with God, which is based on grace, truth, and love. One thing I want us to also note, it talks about the changing of the heart and the mind. Many of times I cringe when people try to minimize the mind, think only about the heart. God has never dissociated the heart from them. They always work together. So as believers, living out the covenant today means that we should embrace our identity in Christ. Allow the promises of the new covenant to shape us. New heart, new mind, transformation, the law of God in our heart to be able to obey God. It means trusting in Jesus as the mediator and the high priest so that we can live in freedom of the forgiveness of our sins and being transformed daily into his image by the Holy Spirit. This is the call to live in the light of his better covenant. This is where God's laws are not burdensome to us because they are written in our hearts. Meaning if you are a Christian, we cannot say that, yeah, this, I can't do it. God says this, that I can't do it. God says that he's giving us the ability. Let's embrace it and take advantage of it. Let the reality of the new covenant define who we are. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. And my emphasis here, because of the way things are nowadays, we are transformed. Let us live out this identity with confidence and joy in Christ. Let us allow the Holy Spirit to continue transforming to guide us to a deeper relationship with God that will enable us to live according to God's will. As we go from here, let this be a testament to us of the faithfulness of God. Let us respond with this covenant of love, with faith, with obedience, and a heart which is full of gratitude, knowing what God has done. May the Lord help us and bless us. Amen. Let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the better covenant that you have established through Jesus Christ. Help us to live in the fullness of your promises transformed by the Holy Spirit and confident in our identity as people of God. May our lives be a reflection of your love, your grace, that we may honor the covenant 
that you have made with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh Lord our God, you are the most high. You are God in heaven and you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power, might are in your hands. No one can withstand you and we praise you. Let us hear with the love of God and taste that the Lord God Almighty is good that we trust him. May we arise and shine because our light has come. May the glory of the Lord rise and shine upon us. May the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in our hearts richly. May we be strengthened to do the things that he has called us to do in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. May the Lord order our steps in his word. And may the Most High deliver us from every oppression. May the storms of life be stilled in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We shall live and not die, but declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen.